So, <clears throat> before going to neutrino oscillations, I would like to say a few words regarding the material of my first lecture. Um, I mentioned that uh, the difference between Dirac and Maillard particles are that, uh, fermions, are that for a Dirac fermion, we can write down the, the composition into uh, left-handed and right-handed components. And the right-handed component is a completely independent from the left one. Whereas for Majorana particle, the necessary right-handed component is just the uh, particle-antiparticle conjugate of its left-handed one. So it is, in a sense, a more economical construct. It has fewer degrees of freedom. Okay. Uh, now, when I mentioned that in the Dirac case, these two fields are independent, uh, it may raise some question. There was actually a question raised yesterday in the coffee break. If you write down the Dirac equation in components for this psi left and psi right, we will find a system of two coupled differential equations. So in a sense, th they are related to each other through the Dirac equation. So how can we say that they are independent? The answer is that we should use this argument before we apply equation of motion. We can say that uh, Majorana particle can be written, a uh, Majorana particle field can be written in this way, irrespective of what is the equation of motion satisfied by psi left. Its right-handed component of this field is always psi left c, whatever is the equation satisfied by psi left. Okay? So that's a very general thing, because we want to discuss this at the Lagrangian level. And at the Lagrangian level, we shouldn't apply equation of motion yet. For example, if we apply the equation of motion for the Dirac Lagrangian, then applying equations of motion, we get identically zero. But this doesn't mean that Dirac Lagrangian doesn't exist, of course. We just shouldn't apply equation of motion to the field in the Lagrangian. Okay. So next thing. I mentioned that out of all known particles, only neutrinos can be of Majorana nature. We don't yet know whether neutrinos are Majorana particles or Dirac particles, even though it's much nicer, in my opinion, uh, the possibility uh, that neutrino may be Majorana particle is much nicer. But it's a matter of taste, of course. And the final word should be given by the experiment. So we don't know whether neutrinos are Majorana or Dirac particles. Uh, how about neutron? Can neutron be a Majorana particle? It has zero charge. It's a fermion with zero charge. So who could answer this question? I didn't mention neutron yesterday when I discussed possible candidates for being a Majorana particle. Why neutron cannot be a Majorana particle, if it cannot? It yeah? has a baryon number. It has a baryon number, good. But the baryon number is not an exact quantum number of the standard model. OK. OK, very good. So we know that it consists of three quarks, which are all charged. It's one U quark and two D quarks. So when we make a charge conjugation on this, they become anti-quarks with the opposite charges. And it's not identical to the original neutron. However, assume we that we don't know anything about the substructure of neutron, its quark composition. Yes? Isospin? Isospin? Isospin. Again, isospin is, on, is not the exact quantum number, okay? And it's, it's kind of approximate description which is useful in some situations, but not in all of them, especially when we discuss neutrons, protons, and so on. Okay. So any other ideas? Why neutron cannot be a Majorana particle? Uh, actually, the quarks are part of, yeah. of the weak interaction, not neutron themselves. Okay. Okay. 
So neutrino can also interact, is also a part of the weak interaction. So why do we say that neutrino can be Majorana particle, but neutron cannot? <coughs> magnetic moment. Neutron has no electric charge, but it has a magnetic moment. And its antiparticle has an opposite, the opposite uh, magnetic moment, OK? So it cannot be any charge-like characteristic, whatever it is, even magnetic moment, which is opposite for particle and antiparticle, shouldn't be there. And this in particular means that neutrino cannot have, Majorana neutrino cannot have magnetic moment, whereas Dirac neutrino can have. In reality, the situation is a little bit more complicated because we know that there is no, not just one neutrino species, there are three of them, and neutrinos, even if they are Majorana, they can have transition magnetic moment, off diagonal magnetic moment. But unfortunately, I don't have time to discuss this. Now, one more question. We say that neutrinos which are emitted in, for example, in beta decay of uh, fission fragments in nuclear reactors are anti-neutrinos. We call them anti-neutrinos. And neutrinos produced in the sun, we call neutrinos. Does it mean that, uh, actually, it's non-experimental that, that these are distinct particles, they are different? Does it mean that we already know that neutrino is a Dirac particle? Not Majorana, because we say we have neutrino and anti-neutrino, and they are different. Yes, please. Energy is much higher than their mass. So Sorry? Their energy is much higher than their right. mass. Right. So we can't see if it's Majorana or Dirac. That's actually the correct answer. So chirality is opposite for particles which we call neutrino and particles which we call anti-neutrino. We can either say that these are neutrino and antineutrino, or this is a left-handed particle and right-handed particle. And for high-energy neutrinos with energy much bigger than their mass, chirality is nearly conserved. So it's a good, nearly good quantum number. So description in terms of chirality is quite good. So we can say that neutrinos with left-handed chirality are neutrinos, and neutrinos with right-handed chirality are antineutrinos, even though we don't know whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana particles. Okay, so that was still regarding my yesterday's lecture. Now I want to move to a different topic, neutrino oscillations. We note that neutrinos can oscillate, which means that, for example, an electron neutrino can, after some time and upon propagating some distance, become a muon neutrino, which then again it becomes electron neutrino, and so on and so forth. So neutrinos can periodically change their identity. They have some split identity, it's like uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of story. It's double personality or even triple personality. Okay? And most interestingly, this happens without any external influence. We are used to situations when particles um, change their identity in the process of interacting with other particles, or when they decay, for example, they can disappear. Now, neutrinos can change their identity without any external influence at all. And the simplest case of two flavor oscillation, the probability of neutrino going, electron neutrino going into muon neutrino uh, upon propagating distance L is given by this simple formula. Okay? There's a factor which gives us the amplitude of the oscillations of um, probability, transition probability, which is uh, sine square of 2 theta. Theta is a um, mixed angle. And it can take maximal value when mixed angle is 45 degrees. And it is zero if mixing angle is either zero or pi over two. So this would mean absence of mixing. And there is an oscillating term, which depends on neutrino mass square difference, neutrino momentum, and the propagated distance in this way. Uh, this formula is valid for ultra-relativistic neutrinos. And we always deal practically with ultra-relativistic neutrinos. Okay? And hints of oscillations were first uh, obtained, I think, in the solar neutrino experiment, but the first unambiguous evidence was only obtained by the Super Kamekanda uh, collaboration in their uh, atmospheric neutrino data. So the idea, actually, that neutrinos can oscillate was put forward much earlier, before all these experiments, uh, originally by Bruno Pontecorvo, who considered oscillations of neutrinos in uh, analogy with oscillations of neutral K mesons. This was because 
uh, it was not known at that time that there's more than one neutrino species. Okay? Uh, the idea of flavor oscillation was first put forward by uh, Makina, Kagawa, and Sakata in 1962. And actually, the paper was submitted two weeks after the discovery of the second neutrino flavor. And uh, according to Sandeep Pakwasa, the authors didn't know about that. So when they wrote this paper, they didn't know that the second neutrino species exists. Okay. And here you can see the authors of this beautiful idea, idea. Bruno Pantecorvo, Shuichi Sakata, uh, Ziro Maki, and Masamu Nakagawa. And as I mentioned in my first lecture, neutrinos were unambiguously established to oscillate in the solar neutrino experiment, in the reactor experiment, and atmospheric neutrinos, uh, neutrino experiment, and the uh, accelerator uh, neutrino experiment uh, results. Now, even though the oscillation phenomenon may look a little bit strange, it's actually quite well known in quantum mechanics. In any textbook of quantum mechanics, you can find an example of a two-level quantum system. So we have two uh, energy levels, E1 and E2, which are described by the state Psi1 and Psi2. And we know that these are stationary states, which mean that uh, upon time, they evolve into themselves multiplied by the phase factor exponential minus i energy times t. Okay? And therefore, the probability of finding a system uh, in one of these two states doesn't change with time. If it is initially in one of these two states, it will remain in the same state. Because the probability is just given by square modulus of this uh, wave function. Now, assume that we managed to create a state which is not an eigenstate of the system, but a linear superposition, A times Psi 1 plus B times Psi 2. And we can normalize A and B in the usual way. Okay? Now, upon uh, some time, it will evolve, the state will evolve into this combination. This state Psi 1 will pick up the exponential factor, exponential minus i, e1, t, and similar to state psi2. Now, if we consider the probability that after some time t, this state will still remain in the same, uh, in the same state, actually, the, the, the evolved state will remain in the same state as the initial one, we have to project the evolved state onto the initial one and take the square modulus according to the rules of quantum mechanics. And you immediately see that this probability will oscillate with time. It's given a square modulus exponential factors, this one, plus b square, another exponential factor. Or we can rewrite it using the normalization condition for a and b in this way. So we have the oscillation amplitude given by 4 times a square b square, which means that if either a or b is 0, there will be no oscillations. And the oscillation amplitude is maximal when modulus of A is equal to modulus of B. And there is an oscillating term with frequency which is given by one half of the energy difference between these two states. That's a well-known example from quantum mechanics. So what happens with neutrinos is essentially the same. We have neutrinos which are produced in weak interactions, which are not eigenstates of the free propagation. And therefore, upon some time, they will go into a different mixture of different eigenstate of weak interaction. So it looks very simple. However, if you look into this in more detail, you will find some very subtle points. For example, how do we calculate the probability of neutrino production in some process? We know that uh, probabilities of processes in quantum theory are given by, by the generalized Fermi-Golden rule. So it is uh, 2 pi to the 4 delta function of all four um, sum of the all four momenta in the initial state minus the same for the final state times square root modulus of the 
matrix element of the transition operator times the phase space volume. Okay. For all particles in, in the final state. Can we, for example, apply this to neutrino production? We immediately see a problem. This delta function just gives us the four momentum conservation, energy and momentum conservation. So if we know energies and momenta of all particles which participate in neutrino production, we can find the energy and momentum of neutrino itself. However, if we know it, then from the dispersion law, E square is equal to P square <coughs> plus M square, we can find out the mass of the emitted neutrino. If we know the mass of the emitted neutrino, this means that we have emitted a mass eigenstate, not a flavor state. And mass eigenstates do not oscillate. So that's one problem. There are many other problems. So if you look more carefully into the theory of neutrino oscillation, you'll find many subtleties which are actually rarely discussed. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, you remember I discussed already uh, the relevant part of the Lagrangian uh, for neutrino oscillations which contains the charge current interaction term and uh, mass terms for charged leptons and neutrinos which are originally in general non-diagonal. However, we can diagonalize them and then we'll have diagonal mass terms but the charge current part will pick up a matrix, the product of VL dagger and UL, where VL and UL diagonalize uh, masses of left-handed uh, uh, mass, mass matrices of left-handed rotation, which diagonalize the mass matrices of charged leptons and neutrinos. And here E and nu without primes are already mass against state. Now we can call this product of the two matrices the leptonic mixing matrix or PMNS matrix and introduce the fields which are obtained by acting by this matrix on the neutrino mass eigenstates. And these fields are called flavor states. What is their meaning? Flavor state nu alpha is the neutrino flavor state which is emitted together with the charged leptons of flavor alpha, where alpha is electron, muon or tau, or in principle can be also a sterile neutrino, if sterile neutrino exists. Now this is the relation for the fields. If we go from the fields to the states, then we get just this formula with a complex conjugation of this matrix U. Next, by using some simple rules, which I'll discuss a little bit later, we can obtain the oscillation probability for neutrino nu alpha uh, produced at the origin of the coordinates <coughs> to become nu beta upon propagating distance L. And it's given by the squared modulus of the amplitude of this transition. And the amplitude of this transition is shown here, and it has a very simple meaning. This term here projects the produced flavor state alpha onto the mass basis. Why do we need this? Because we don't have a simple rule for evolution of flavor state. The evolution of mass against states is very simple. Mass against states just pick up some phase factors. But the flavor states do not. Therefore, we have to go first from flavor state to the mass against state. So we project them onto the mass against state basis. This phase factor is just the propagator. It propagates mass against states from point zero to point L. And then we project it back onto the flavor state, but this may be flavor state uh, of different type, or the same type. Beta may be equal or not equal to alpha. And then we take the square modulus of this amplitude. We sum over all mass eigenstate, all possibilities of um, neutrino mass eigenstate propagating from the initial to the final point, and we take the square modulus. Sorry. Yeah. In the exponent we have delta mig. What yes. What is j? Okay, so it's just introduced for convenience. So I is the clear has a clear meaning. Okay. Now what is J? It's convenient to take instead of the masses, mass is uh, squared mass, squared mass differences. And the result doesn't depend on J. So whatever J we take, 
the result will be the same. It's a simple exercise which I suggest for you. Well, the answer is obvious, because of the models. Mm -hmm. If we take a different J, we'll get a common face for all these factors, which can be taken out and then disappears into models. Okay. It's just much more convenient to work with mass square differences at this level. And in the end, the physical result will only depend on mass square difference, will not depend on the masses, only on mass square difference. <coughs> exactly because of, of the modulus here. Now, what you can see from this formula already, that neutrino oscillation disappear if there is no mixing, if the mixing matrix U is trivial, just unit matrix. In this case, uh, the flavor transitions are not possible. You immediately can see that. Another limit in which there are no flavor transitions is that uh, delta M square, all the mass square differences vanish. For example, if neutrinos are massless, or they have mass, but all the masses are the same. If neutrinos are degenerate in mass, there are no oscillation. This is immediately seen from this simple formula. Okay? Okay, how shall we proceed to calculate the neutrino oscillation probability, the formula which I discussed before? The usual way is the following. We assume that initially we produce a flavor eigenstate alpha, which can be decomposed in terms of the mass eigenstate, as I said. Then we assume that neutrinos can be described by plane waves. And in this case, upon propagating uh, distance x and uh, time uh, over time t, we can just put the exponential phase factors for each mass eigenstate, where pi is the four momentum of the uh, mass eigenstate i. Okay? And x is a four vector of t and x vector. Okay? So the phase here is just given by this expression. It's energy times time minus momentum times x. And then we take the square modulus of this expression. Now, how can we calculate this phase? Well, first of all, one simplification which is qual quite well justified, we can assume that p is parallel to x. If the distance between the neutrino source and detector is much bigger than the transversal sizes of the source and detector, that's a very good approximation. Just to simplify things, to have one dimensional description in terms of, in, in, instead of the three dimensional, even though we can, of course, uh, have a more accurate description. So then the phase difference, which is important for neutrino oscillations, is delta E times T minus delta P times X. Delta here means difference of two different mass eigenstates. I don't write down indices here, I, J, uh, uh, like this, just to simplify the notation. But you should remember that this refers to the difference of energies and momenta of different mass eigenstates. Okay? Now, how then we obtain the standard formula, which I already discussed? There are some shortcuts for this. We need to calculate the oscillation phase. So one simple possibility is assume that neutrinos are produced with the same momentum. Of course, they have then different energies, because if they had both same momentum, same energy, they would have same mass. Okay? So if delta P is 0, then the energies can be found from this formula. And taking into account that we deal with relativistic neutrinos, we get this result. So energy of neutrino eigen mass eigenstate i is equal to p plus mi squared over 2p. And then delta E, which enters into the, this formula, is just delta m squared divided by 2e. Then taking into account that for relativistic point like neutrinos, the distance propagated is nearly the same as the time over which the propagation occurs. We immediately substituting this into the formula which I discussed before, this one and this one, we immediately get the standard formula for neutrino oscillations. Okay? We can do something different. Some people prefer different approach. I say, okay, let's assume that neutrinos are produced not with the same momentum, but with the same energy. Okay? Delta E is zero. <coughs> then the phase, oscillation phase, which is phase difference of different mass eigenstate, is equal to minus delta P times X. Then again, we can expand 
this formula and get for p expression e minus del uh, m square over 2p. And minus delta p, which enters here, which is pi p1 minus p2, for example, is equal approximately to delta m square over 2e. And again, we get the same standard oscillation formula with the standard oscillation length given by 4 pi e divided by delta m square. And in convenient units, it's about 2.5 meters times energy in MeV divided by delta m square uh, in electron volt squared, or uh, distance in kilometers and energy in GeV. Then the, the numerical value will be the same. Okay. Now, these two methods of obtaining the standard formula for neutrino oscillation are very simple and transparent and allow to us to arrive very quickly at the desired result. Now, the trouble with them is they are both wrong. Because there is no reason whatsoever to expect that neutrinos will be produced with the same energy or same momentum. It's just wrong in general. Okay? So how can we calculate the oscillation probability if we do not use these wrong assumptions? So let's consider a neutrino production process with very simple kinematic. Uh, kinematics, two body production process like uh, charge pi on decay. For pi on decay at rest, like this one, we can calculate exactly energy and momentum of produced mass against state neutrino. Well, of course, what is produced is a flavor state, but it is composed of mass against state. For each mass against state, we can find the corresponding energy and momentum. And they are given by energy momentum conservation by this formula. Now, we can simplify them a little bit. If we neglect terms which are of the fourth order at neutrino mass, then we can write down energy and momentum of the mass against that I as some factor, or some uh, term which is independent on the of I, plus term which is proportional to m square over 2e for each mass against state, multiplied by factor psi, which is obtained immediately from these formulas, and is equal one half one minus and mu square of and p square for the mu uh, pi on decay into muon. For pi on decay into electron and electron neutrino, we would have electron mass here. Okay. Now for the momentum, we have the same i independent term minus one minus psi m i square over two e. Now same energy and same momentum assumptions would correspond to psi equal to zero or psi equal to one. If psi equal to zero, we have same energy. If psi equal to one, we have same momentum. In reality, psi equal is equal 0 0.2, neither zero nor one. Moreover, if we consider the decay of charged pion not into muon and muon neutrino, but into electron and electron neutrino, we will have to put here the electron mass, and psi will be just one half with good accuracy. So we would be exactly between same energy and same momentum situations. So none of them is wrong. Moreover, uh, if we even assume that we find some Lorentz frame in which energies of two mass eigen states will coincide, this will not be a Lorentz invariant statement. In any other Lorentz frame, this will not be true. Moreover, for three flavor states, we know that there are three, we cannot do it even uh, by, by looking for a proper Lorentz frame. Now the question is, how can two different and wrong assumptions lead to the same and correct result? And to understand this, we will need actually, well, before I go there, some, uh, let's discuss the problems of the plane vane approximation. I was using plane vane approximation. And this was actually the source of most of the problems. If we assume same momentum, oscillation probability depend only on time. You remember, we, then to write them in terms of the coordinate, we had to invoke some additional assumption that the time is equal to coordinate for neutrino. But this assumption is only true, it's called sometimes time to space conversion. It's only true for point-like particles moving on a classical trajectory. Point-like particle is something which is completely opposite to plane wave. So we cannot use together plane waves and point-like particles. <coughs> <Okay>. Next, <coughs> same energy. 
oh sorry before I go to same energy another problem with this approach <coughs> if we have uh, <coughs> if we use sorry for my voice <coughs> if we invoke same energy uh, same momentum approach then the oscillation probability strictly speaking depends only on time and then we, we are left at very paradoxical conclusion we don't need far detectors for neutrino experiment we just had to put the detector very close to the source and wait long enough because the probability depends only on time. That's an absurd, of course. That, that's not, that cannot be correct. Okay. Same energy. It's slightly better than the same momentum, but again, there are problems. <coughs> uh, the oscillation probability depends only on coordinate. In this way, we cannot consider the situation when neutrinos were produced in some time and then detect it at some different time. We have to consider only stationary situations. For stationary situations, uh, this is a relatively good approximation, but otherwise it is not. So the problem is the use of plane waves and application of energy momentum conservation. So what are the consistent approaches? How can we obtain the oscillation probability in a consistent way? There are two possibilities. <coughs> One of them is the quantum mechanical wave packet approach. We should consider neutrinos as wave packets and not as plane waves. And second one is the quantum field theory based approach. We just consider the neutrino production, propagation and detection as a single process described by a large Feynman diagram. Okay? So these are, I mean, I wrote just, um, um, I did, um, just one particle here, but it's a collection of all particles in the initial state. If it is decay, <coughs> that's just one particle, but if it is uh, a collision, the more than one, the same for final states. And then we just assume that we describe the total process, neutrino production, propagation, and detection by a Feynman diagram like this. And by doing this, we can extract the oscillation probability from the probability of the overall process under some conditions, it's not always that we can extract it. Unfortunately, I will not have time to discuss this quantum field theory based approach. I will only concentrate on the first one. But one interesting question which is sometimes uh, asked regarding this approach. Assume that we produce neutrino in the sun, 150 million kilometers away and detect it at the Earth. Can such process be described by a Feynman diagram with this distance? 150 million kilometers long. Normally we don't do that. We assume that the production process gives us some flux, which is uh, reduced because of, of one over R square law when neutrinos come to the Earth. And then we assume that we know this flux and calculate the <coughs> neutrino detection probability. We don't consider it as one process. So can we actually consider the Feynman diagram with s such a long propagator, actually? And would these two approaches be consistent with each other? Just a standard one where we calculate flux and then the cross-section of detection? Or we just consider a single process? The answer is, of course, yes, we can. Quantum field theory works at any distances. Of course, such a description will be more complicated than the standard one in which we first calculate the flux. Then we, we calculate the flux at the Earth and the cross-section. Okay? But the result will be exactly the same if we apply, if we consistently and accurately apply uh, the quantum field theory uh, approach to this process, like just one single process. It's actually quite not trivial because some factors wi which enter into the uh, cross section, for example, or enter into the propagator here uh, are different, but they conspire in such a way that the final result is exactly the same exactly the same. So this is not necessary if we don't speak about neutrino oscillations, where there are some questions which we don't know how to answer and we want to use quantum field theory to answer them. But the result in principle is exactly the same. Okay, now wave packet approach. What are wave packets? If we describe plane waves, plane waves are described by the exponential factors like this. And the probability of finding particle, in this case, which is given by square modulus of this exponential phase factor, is coordinate independent, which means the plane wave 
has the same probability everywhere in space. Obviously, plane waves cannot describe localized propagating particles. We need something different. However, if we go back to the formula, which I discussed in the beginning, here we obviously consider particles as plane waves. For example, if we calculate probability of some, of some processes at LHC or any other processes, we use this formula with absolute success. We don't have to consider wave packets. So why is it so that for neutrinos we need wave packets? Why are neutrinos so different? What's special about them? First of all, if we just calculate some processes with neutrinos, like for example neutrino electron scattering, or neutrino capture on the nucleus, we don't have to use wave packets. We only need to use wave packets when we discuss neutrino oscillations. And the reason is very simple. We have to take into account that, neutri that neutrino source is located in some region of space. And neutrino detector is located in another region of space. And they are separated by some distance L. If we cannot take this into account, we cannot describe neutrino oscillations. That's the reason why we actually need wave packets. And the reason why we don't need wave packets for most of other processes is that typically the uncertainties of energies on moment of neutrinos, which are the, the main point of the wave packet, are so small compared to the energies and momenta themselves that in most situations we can just neglect them. We know that these are wave packets, but we neglect the small uncertainties in energy and momenta unless we discuss neutrino oscillations. And that's it. And then that's why all these formulas work perfectly well if we do not describe neutrino oscillations. Now, how can we describe localized states uh, in quantum theory? By the way, in any good textbook of quantum field theory, the description always starts with wave packets. And only after that, you go to the plane waves. Take Peskin and Schroeder, for example. Always. Why is it so? Why we should start with this? You remember the basis of all calculations in, in quantum field, uh, all calculations of uh, particular processes in quantum field theory are based on S matrix theory. And S matrix theory assumes that we have some collection of particles which are separated by large distance and therefore they are not oscillating, uh, sorry, not, not, not interacting. Then they move closer to each other start interacting, something very complicated happens, and then the, re the products of this interaction again move to very large distances at which they can be considered free, non-interacting. So this is the basis of S-matrix theory. You cannot build such a theory without assuming that neutrinos at large distances from each other are free particles. Now, in order to consider this, you need wave packets, because if you just use plane waves, you cannot describe in separation of particles. The probability, uh, or pr the probability of finding them is the same everywhere in space. So you need wave packets just to introduce S matrix. Later you can say, if the uncertainties of energies on mom and momenta of all particles are tiny compared to the energies and momenta themselves, we can neglect them and describe them as plane waves. But we should start with wave packets. OK, let's go to wave packets. This is some kind of pictorial representation of a plane wave, or part of the plane wave. Now, what are the wave packets? If instead of plane wave, we take a bunch of plane waves with different momenta p, and with weights which are different, we can assume that at some momentum p0, uh, the weight is a maximal one, but then when we go away from this momentum, the weights f become smaller. Then the wave function in the coordinate space is given just by, by the sum of all these plane waves over the momentum, so which is a Fourier transform of this function f. So these two functions, psi and f, are related by Fourier transformation, and therefore uh, if psi is the coordinate space uh, wave function of our particle, then f is just the momentum space wave function. In the case of plane waves, this is just a delta function. There's only one harmonics with momentum p0. In reality, there is some spread of momenta. And this is related to the fact that all particles are produced in a finite space-time region. 
in the localized region. Then due to the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, their momentum should have some intrinsic quantum mechanical uncertainty. Here you have two simple examples, just a very simple toy model. If we assume that momentum distribution of a particle has a box type shape, then its Fourier transform will have shape like this. You will have uh, a particle which is mostly uh, localized within this region with the um, probability of finding particle quickly decreasing when we go away from this point. If we take a Gaussian wave packet in the momentum space, then the wave packet in the coordinate space turns out to be also Gaussian. And if we have some spread of momentum or momentum uncertainty characterizing our momentum distribution, then the spread of the coordinate is given uh, by the Heisberg uncertainty relation. S uh, sigma x sigma p is bigger than one half and for Gaussian wave packets exactly equal to one half. So typically what we have is that if the uncertainty in the momentum of some particle is sigma p, then the uncertainty in momentum is of the order of one over sigma p. You can find this statement in many uh, textbooks or, or lecture courses. However, there is a question. We know that sigma x sigma p is bigger than one half. Here we assume that it's of the order of one half or one. So why we assume that it is of the order and not bigger? The answer is that this is correct for any reasonable shape wave packet. What is a reasonable shape? Gaussian wave packet is, has a reasonable shape. Or bright Wigner shape uh, wave packet has a reasonable shape. Let me give you an, an example of unreasonable shape, which we never deal with, but which will explain when we can have a situation when sigma x, sigma p is actually much bigger than, than one. Okay? Assume we have a momentum distribution of this type. With two peaks separated by big distance in the momentum space. Okay? This is P1, this is P2. Okay? The width of each of them is sigma P small. And uh, if you calculate the momentum uncertainty, that's very easy. You know in how to do it in quantum mechanics. You just uh, write down the wave function and calculate the dispersion. Dispersion is p square average minus p average square. And this dispersion gives us the momentum uncertainty of the state. Okay? If we calculate it, you'll find that the dispersion is given by this distance, sigma capital which is much bigger in this case than the width of each particular wave packet here. So does it mean that the coordinate uncertainty, sigma x is of order of one over sigma p, which may, would mean that the state is extremely localized I I in the coordinate space? The answer is no. If you calculate the spread of the energy using the same formula, you'll get that sigma x is of the order of 1 over sig small sigma p. So the localization is space is a reciprocal of the, uh, the width of the each of these two individual peaks, not of, of distance between them. And this is exactly the situation when sigma x sigma p is much bigger than 1. But that's, as I said, it's not the situation we normally deal with, which is the unnatural situation. Okay. okay. So, one example, as I said, the Gaussian wave packet, or for, for which uh, the function f is given by this simple formula, is normalized so that uh, the square of the modulus f uh, squared is equal to 1, uh, the integral of the square of the modulus um, f is equal to 1. And momentum dispersion here calculated in the usual way is equal to sigma p squared by sigma p this term in the denominator. 
And if we calculate the corresponding wave packet in the coordinate space, then we get uh, the wave packet which is uh, essentially has the same Gaussian shape. Now, how can we calculate neutrino oscillation probability in terms of the wave packets instead of the plane waves? You remember we wrote down before the formula in which uh, the evolved neutrino state was given by the um, product of the matrix element of the leptonic mixing matrix and uh, mass, uh, evolved mass states which had some exponential factors uh, in front of the initial state. Here, instead of this, we ins instead of the plane wave exponential factor, we should put the wave packet in the coordinate space. The wave packet depending on the x and t, on coordinate and time. So the index s here uh, is to remind us that we consider neutrino produced in some source. Okay? So s stands for the source. So how can we simplify this formula? Assume for simplicity that we consider the Gaussian wave packet. Well, actually we don't need to consider the Gaussian wave packet. Any reasonable shape wave packet which has peak at some value P0 and is relatively sharp. Then we can expand uh, the exponential term here, exponential factor, uh, the exponent of this exponential factor near this maximum of the momentum distribution function which are called P capital. So we take uh, energy as energy at P capital plus DE over DP, P minus P capital, plus higher order terms. Okay. And if this maximum is sharp enough, then we can actually neglect these higher order terms. Now the derivative here is, by definition, the group velocity of the wave packet. So we have energy at the peak value of momentum plus, plus group, group velocity multiplied by P minus P capital. And then it's quite easy to show that in this approximation, if we neglect higher order terms in the expansion, we can find a very simple formula for the wave packet of, of a particle, uh, which is given by the phase factor, which is very similar to the plane wave. However, it's taken at the momentum which is equal to the uh, peak momentum of our momentum distribution function, multiplied by some envelope factor, which gives us a modulation of this plane wave. And this envelope factor, for example, in the case of uh, Gaussian wave packet in the momentum space, this envelope factor will be also Gaussian. Okay. Now, notice that it depends, actually, the, the, the expression for it, which you can derive from the previous procedure, which I discussed just a minute ago, is given by this formula. And you can immediately see, first of all, that it takes maximum when its argument vanishes, because we have a uh, fast oscillating factor here, and when x is equal to Vgt, then it vanishes, and we, we don't have a strong suppression in this case. Okay. And this corresponds to the uh, center of the wave packet. So the center of the wave packet corresponds to x equal to v times t, which means that the center of the wave packet moves like a classical point-like particle. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the coordinate and time for a uh, classical point-like particle. And the same is true for the center of the wave packet, but not for the wave packet itself we can take in general values of x and t, which are not exactly related by this formula. However, as we shall see, they cannot differ by much. They can only differ by the actually the coordinate length of the wave packet. Okay. Next, we have to do the same with the detected state. Detected state is a wave packet whose properties are determined by the detection process. Okay. So we can also write it as a wave packet in the coordinate space, which is uh, the Fourier transform of the momentum space wave packet. What does the alpha go to zero? Sorry? Does the alpha go to zero? What, what uh, alpha. Alpha here is uh, this term, ah. higher order terms. So just saying that I'm neglecting higher order terms. Okay. 
Okay, and then we have to project the evolved neutrino state onto the detector state. And this immediately gives us that the amplitude of neutrino transition during time t capital and upon propagating distance l capital uh, is given by this formula. It has product of two elements of uh, neutrino uh, of leptonic mixing matrix times the amplitude corresponding to the propagation of a given mass eigenstate i and sum over all mass eigenstates. Okay. And this amplitude just from the previous calculation is given by this very simple formula. Well, I suggest that you try to reproduce all these calculations. They will be online, and it's very easy to follow them, but it gives you a lot of more of understanding on, of what's going on. That's a very simple form. Yes? Sorry, what is F here again? Is it from the same form like Fs, just for a detector? Or? Oh, why I use the wave packet for the detector? So here we have two momentum distribution. This is for neutrino produced in the source, and this is for neutrino uh, detected at the detector. And the reason why we use them, the shape and the properties of these wave packets are determined by the emission process in one case or detection process in another case. For example, particles which participate in the detection process are also, are also localized. They should also be described by wave packets. And the wave packet of the detected neutrino state depends on the properties of the wave packets of particles which participate in neutrino detection. Actually, if you uh, use the quantum field theory approach, it's very easy to understand how we obtain these wave packets. We actually, it's a constructive approach. We actually not assume that we have some wave packet and with some properties which we want to estimate. We derive these wave packets in the quantum field theory approach. Okay, now for a Gaussian wave packet, uh, this amplitude for mass eigenstate i is its dependence of t and l uh, in addition to the standard uh, plane wave type dependence contains the factor which uh, for, Ga for the Gaussian wave packets contains uh, exponential mo minus l minus vt square over 4 sigma x square where sigma x square depends on the uncertainties of the coordinate of neutrino production and detection <coughs> processes, on both of them. Okay. And you immediately see the following. This factor takes maximum when L is equal to Vt, which is the center of the wave packet. However, it is not zero if L is not equal to Vt, but the factor will be strongly suppressed if we go far away, L minus Vt becomes larger than sigma x, then we get a strong suppression. So we allow L and Vt to be different from each other, but not but much, by much. The, the formalism will just suppress all the processes when they're uh, different from each other by a large amount. Okay. Now we can go back to the calculation of the neutrino oscillation phase. You remember we have delta phi is equal delta ET minus delta P times L, where energy is delta E is energy difference and delta P is momentum difference of different mass eigenstates. Now let's remember that we always deal with relativistic neutrinos. In this case, the difference of energies of different mass eigenstates is much smaller than the average energy of these states. And therefore we can expand energy difference in terms of the momentum difference. Energy depends on momentum and mass squared. So in terms of the momentum difference and the difference of mass squared. Now delta E over the dp, dE over dp here is just the group velocity. So we have group velocity times delta P. And the derivative of energy with respect to squared mass is just 1 over 2E. So this is the result uh, for energy difference. It depends on momentum difference and of mass squared difference. Now let's plug this back into this formula. I don't want to assume delta E is zero, zero or delta P is zero. We know that it's wrong. 
But I just use the fact that delta E is much smaller than E and delta P is much smaller than P. Uh, any questions? No? Okay, you, you can ask at any time. Okay. Um, so I, I put this expression, this expansion, into this formula. So I have delta E times T is given by this uh, expression times T minus delta P times L. Now look at this. It contains delta P here and here. So let's take them together. So we have minus L minus VG uh, T times delta P plus delta M square over 2E times T. It's very simple arithmetics here. Now, if we assume that neutrinos are produced with the same momentum, which we know is wrong, then this term would disappear because delta P would be zero. And this would give us the standard oscillation phase, assuming that T is equal to Vg. So for classical particle, this would give us the standard oscillation phase. In reality, delta P is not zero. We know that. However, L min minus VGT is a small quantity. At the center of the wave packet is exactly zero. So without even assuming delta P is zero, we get this zero at the center of the wave packet. If we go away from the center of the wave packet, this is not zero, but this had can never be larger or much larger than the length of the wave packet in the coordinate space. So this term is limited from above by uh, sigma x times delta p. So if sigma x times delta p is much less than 1, then we can neglect this term. And then we get the standard oscillation phase. Now, let's do a very similar trick, but instead of expanding delta E in terms of delta P and delta M square, I expand delta P in terms of delta E and delta M square. So I actually uh, extract delta P from the above formula instead of extracting delta E. Formula is the same, but I just take delta P. And I plug it into this expression again. So delta P now in terms of delta E and delta M square. Then again, simple arithmetics, and I obtain a different but equivalent formula for the oscillation phase. It contains L minus VGT divided by VG times delta E plus delta M square over 2P times L. Now, if we assume same energy, then delta E is zero, and again, we have the standard oscillation phase. However, we know that this is wrong. But again, we know that this difference cannot be large. It's smaller than the size of the wave packet in coordinate space. And therefore, if this size times delta E is much less than 1, then we can neglect it and just obtain the standard oscillation phase. Now, what are these conditions that delta X times delta E is much less than 1? The oscillation length is of the order of 1 over delta E. So the condition is actually the condition that the size of the wave packet of neutrino is much smaller than the oscillation length, which is quite a natural condition. If the wave packet of neutrino was larger than the oscillation length, then the oscillations would average over the distance of the size of the, uh, of the order of the size of the neutrino, and we wouldn't see any oscillations at all. So the size of the wave packet should be smaller than the oscillation length. And this is enough to get the correct formula, oscillation formula. Okay. We don't need to invoke some unnatural assumptions like same energy and same momentum. Any questions at this point? Maybe I was too fast, I'm not sure if you followed it. It's just a very simple arithmetic by dividing the oscillation phase into two terms, one of which vanishes at the center of the wave packet or is small if the size of the wave packet is small, and the other part is just the standard oscillation phase, we find the conditions, we find the conditions under which the standard oscillation phase obtains in the calculation of neutrino oscillation probability. Yes, please. What determines the shape of the wave packet of neutrino? Is it intrinsic or it is determined from the initial 
web, uh, in web packet of the initial particle. That yes. Yeah. So uh, let me give you just some examples. Uh, I in all processes we know, the size of the neutrino, the length of the neutrino web packet is microscopic. It's very, very small. For example, f uh, for neutrinos uh, produced in the reactor, it's, uh, I think it's around 10 to minus 8 centimeter. For neutrinos produced in supernova, it's 10 to minus 11 centimeter. Okay? And the oscillation lengths, which we are interested in, are macroscopic quantity. We uh, have the baseline of neutrino experiment fr from kilometers to, to thousands of kilometers. Okay? And this condition that the lengths of the neutrino wave packet is much smaller than the oscillation length is very well satisfied in all cases we know. Even though there may be some exceptions if sterile neutrinos exist, if heavy enough sterile neutrinos exist. I may discuss it a little bit later. Okay? What about the spreading of the wave packet? Sorry? The spreading. the spreading. The spreading of the wave packet is very small for uh, relativistic particles. The spreading corresponds to these higher order terms which are neglected. You remember when I expanded energy uh, in terms of, of deviation of momentum from the, the peak momentum, I only took into account two terms and I neglected higher order derivatives. The higher order derivatives are responsible for this spreading. But for the longitudinal spreading, they're always proportional to the neutrino mass squared. And this is a small, small factor. So in all practical situations, we can safely neglect spreading of wave packets of relativistic particles. If we consider non-relativistic neutrinos, which is not something we normally deal with, then the situation is different. But even in this case, the spreading can be neglected. It's more complicated in that case, but it's still true. Spreading doesn't have any important effect on neutrino oscillations. Uh, I don't understand. This explains why you can make the, cons the plane wave approximation yeah. with the constant E and P. But what yeah. about that thing, the result that you get that is independent of the length? Um, so sorry, once again. We had this. The, yeah, the, yeah. Other, the other contradiction yeah. is that we had that if you make these assumptions, you can yeah. um, it's independent of the, the length of traffic. Yeah. I don't understand how this explains why that. Okay. That's because if you take a square modulus, it's just constant. No. Okay. Yes. Sorry, can, can you speak up a little bit? Other times when you use the shape of the wave packet, so the, the shape of the S function, yeah. or do you only look at the insertion? Well, uh, you can derive it. If you know the shapes of wave packets of all the other particles which participate in neutrino production, then you can derive it. Otherwise, you have to assume something. Okay, now with these derivations, we find the oscillation probability, which is given by this expression. It's square modulus of the uh, oscillation amplitude, and it contains product, uh, the product of four uh, elements of the leptonic mixing matrix, and the amplitudes uh, for neutrino mass eigenstates i and k, and sum over all i and k. But this amplitude is shown here. This is just a summary, okay? Now, look at this. It depends on T and L. Normally, we don't measure time of neutrino propagation in neutrino oscillation experiment. We just measure the distance. So, in principle, we could have measured this, but in order to find non-trivial dependence on both time and distance, we would have to measure them extremely accurately. You remember, uh, they should be nearly equal to each other up to the factor uh, which is the velocity of the neutrino. And if they are unequal by the quantity which is bigger than the size of the wave packet, then we, we immediately get zero, essentially. So to get some non-trivial result, we need to measure both time pr of neutrino propagation and distance of neutrino propagation with extremely high accuracy, which is not actually possible. We cannot measure the distance propagated by neutrino up to the accuracy of the order of microscopic lengths of the neutrino wave packet. And actually, we never do that. We, we never 
never actually measured the time of neutrino propagation, except in some cases, which I'll discuss in a minute, OK? And therefore, it's a good idea to integrate over time. We consider the neutrino propagation over some distance L, and we just integrate it over time, because we don't measure it. Now, I mentioned an exception. You probably know that the, in the accelerator experiment, like, for example, T2K, neutrinos are produced in accelerator bunches. There are bunches of protons which are produce pions, which decay and produce neutrinos. So neutrinos arrive at the super Kamiokande detector in bunches. And that's extremely helpful because super Kamiokande detector also measures, for example, solar and atmospheric neutrinos. Okay? Atmospheric neutrinos are most important in this case. So how can <coughs> we discriminate re, uh, neutrinos coming from the uh, accelerator in Tokai, in Japan, from the atmospheric neutrinos? by timing. We know exactly when neutrino bunch was emitted. We know the flight time over 300 kilometers is very short distance, but still it's measurable uh, uh, time delay. And we only consider neutrino signal in the time window, which correspond to the duration of the bunch, with a delay corresponding to the time flight uh, of neutrinos from the uh, neutrino accelerator, from the accelerator to the neutrino detector. Okay. So this is a counterexample to what I said before. We do measure the neutrino time of flight in this case. However, the duration of the bunch is many orders of magnitude bigger than the passage time of one neutrino wave packet. So for the uh, sake of the argument of time this distance differences of the order of the passage time of the neutrino wave packet, this is infinity we can very easily integrate over time in this case as well, when we discuss the passage time of neutrino through the detecting particle. I'm not sure if this argument is quite clear. If not, I can discuss it more in more detail. Is it clear or not? Not very clear. Huh? OK, let me discuss it a little bit in more detail. OK, we, we have neutrino bunches in time, which go to the detector. Okay? And we know the flight time, and we know I mean, we just use the time window equal to the duration of this bunch in time, tau, to select the accelerator neutrinos in the detector. Okay? However, this bunch is, I don't remember the numbers, I think it's order of millisecond. Now, here I'm concerned with time dependence, which is related to the exponential factor minus L minus Vt squared divided by sigma x squared, 4 sigma x squared. So the time corresponding to the time over which the neutrino wave packet flies through the certain point in space where our detector particle is situated. Okay? And since sigma x is a microscopic quantity, it can be easily 10 to minus 8 seconds, then this flight time is many orders of magnitude smaller than this time window. And therefore, when we consider, we, we integrate over the, this time window in the detector. So we, this integration is equivalent to fully integrating over infinity uh, for the time variable. When we discuss uh, the issue of flight time of the neutrino wave packet through the detector particle. Is it clear now or not? <laughs> well, just make a simple estimate yourself. Assume that the neutrino wave packet is 10 to minus 8 centimeter. It moves with the speed of light. How long time it will take to, to propagate the distance equal to its own length? and compare it with the duration of this bunch. So the duration of the bunch is actually infinite with good accuracy <coughs> with respect to, to the uh, flight time of neutrino. OK. I'm going slowly, more slowly than I expected. Let me accelerate a little bit. So if we integrate this over time, we obtain this formula here where the 
quantity I twiddle here is the integral of a momentum which contains the product of four momentum distribution functions. Two for the neutrino production, neutrino as the source, and two for neutrino detection, but with shifted arguments. Just follows from the calculation, simple calculation. Shifted arguments. You see here we have minus delta E over V, here we have plus delta E over V. And we have an exponential oscillating factor here, where delta V is the difference of group velocities of different neutrino mass eigenstates. And Q is the integration momentum variable. L is the distance propagated by neutrinos. Now actually Q is a shifted momentum. It's not the momentum itself, but the difference between the neutrino running momentum and the peak momentum. It's convenient to, to use this shifted uh, integration variable. Okay? Now, actually, it's quite easy to understand when neutrino oscillations are destroyed using this formula. But before I, doing, uh, I do this, uh, let me discuss uh, qualitatively the conditions under which neutrino oscillations are detectable or observable. The key words here is coherence. You remember we assumed that neutrinos are produced as flavor state and detected as flavor state. And flavor states are coherent superpositions of different mass eigenstates. What do we mean by coherent? This means that we cannot, by using our production or detection process, discriminate between different mass eigenstates. Otherwise, we would, said, we would have said that we emitted a given neutrino mass eigenstate, and mass eigenstate do not oscillate. Only flavor eigenstate oscillate, and they oscillate because of the interference related to the phase differences of, um, uh, obtained by different mass eigenstate. Okay. So, if neutrino production or detection is coherent, and neutrino propagation is coherent, then we can obtain neutrino oscillation. Let me elaborate on this. Okay. How can coherence be destroyed at neutrino production, for example? Assume we have some production process. Uh, okay, let me skip this. Okay. Assume we ha have some production process and we measure the energies and momenta of all particles participating in, in the production with good accuracy or some accuracy. Okay. Then we can extract using energy and momentum conservation the neutrino energy and momentum also with some accuracy. We cannot extract it exactly because of the energy momentum uh, uncertainty, energy coordinate uncertainty, uh, energy time and momentum coordinate uncertainty for localized processes. Okay. Now, if we know energies and momentum uh, of all particles, we find out the energy and momentum of neutrino and we know the uncertainty with which they. Uh, can be measured. Now, let me just say that this uncertainty are not just the energy resolution or momentum resolution of our detector. These are ultimate uncertainty beyond which we, in principle, cannot measure uh, the energy and momentum of neutrinos. Okay? And they are related to the localization of the neutrino production process. Okay? Now, if we know these quantities, energy, momentum, and energy and momentum uncertainties, we can find out using this formula the uncertainty. We can find out first the mass of neutrino, but with some uncertainty, which is given by this formula, just by differentiating, differentiating this equation. Okay? So we can only determine the mass squared of the neutrino with this uncertainty at best. Beyond this, we cannot go. This quantum mechanics. Okay? Now, if this uncertainty is much smaller than the mass square difference of different neutrinos, this would mean that we know the neutrino mass. If this intrinsic uncertainty is larger than the mass square difference of different neutrinos, then we cannot say anything about the neutrino mass. And only in that case, neutrino oscillations are possible when we cannot say which neutrino mass eigenstate was emitted. And we cannot say this not because our, our um, measurement tools are bad, but because in, in principle impossible due to the quantum mechanical uncertainty relations. Now, 
assume we want to consider the situation in which we destroy coherence at neutrino production. This means that this is a small quantity. Sigma m squared should be smaller than delta m squared. This in particular means that each of these three terms is also smaller than delta m squared. Now, sigma uh, m squared m smaller than delta m squared in particular means that 2p sigma p is smaller than delta m squared. Okay. Now, sigma p from this formula is smaller than delta m squared over 2p. But this is nothing else uh, than the inverse oscillation length up to the factor 2 pi. So what we found here is that we can only destroy coherence at production. Destroy means that we, we cannot emit uh, coherently neutrinos of different mass. We either emit one mass against state or another mass against state, but not their coherent superposition. Because we found the, the mass with very high accuracy. Okay? So we destroy it only if the momentum uncertainty at production is smaller than the inverse oscillation length or the coordinate uncertainty at production is bigger than the oscillation length. But then it's obvious that we cannot observe oscillation. If the uncertainty in the coordinate of the production point is bigger than the oscillation length, then we, we just average over all oscillations and we never see oscillation pattern. So it's a very simple explanation. Why very accurate measurement of energy and momentum of neutrino at production destroys neutrino oscillation. Because for such a measurement, we need the production process to be delocalized in space and time to, to such an extent that the region in which neutrino is produced is bigger than the oscillation length. So if there are many oscillation lengths in this region, you will not see any oscillation because you don't know exactly the coordinate. You only know it to some, uh, with some uncertainty. So you have to integrate over the size of the production point. And then you average out all the neutrino oscillations. So a very simple explanation. And very similar situation for neutrino detection. Exactly the same argument. If by measuring energies and momenta of the detection uh, of, of the particles which participate in neutrino detection, we find out the energy and momentum of neutrino with very high accuracy. We destroy uh, the coherence of the detected neutrino state. And this would mean that we will not see any oscillation. We will not be able to see it. So these are neutrino production coherence and neutrino detection <coughs> coherence. There is one more type of possible decoherence, which is called propagation decoherence. By the way, do you have any questions about production detection coherence? Well, that's a very important issue. So if you have any doubts or, or anything which is not quite clear, please ask me. Uh, because that's a corner point of uh, cornerstone of neutrino oscillation theory. Okay. Okay. Next thing is the following one. We know that neutrinos, propagating particles, including neutrinos, should be described by wave packets, and we say that neutrinos are produced as flavor eigenstate, which are linear superposition of mass eigenstate, and each of them is described by wave packet. So assume we have two wave packets which were produced as overlap wave packets in neutrino production. Each of them uh, correspond to one mass eigenstate. Different mass eigenstates move with different group velocities. And after long enough time, they will separate and will no longer overlap. So if this happens, we also lose coherence. This, this is called propagation decoherence. So this is yet another possible source of violation of coherence in neutrino oscillations. Okay. So how can we estimate this? Assume that difference of group velocities of different mass against state is equal delta V. Then the coherence time is defined as time over which they separate by the distance which is equal or bigger than the size, the length of the wave packet. If this distance is bigger than the length of the wave packet itself, they no longer overlap. And then the coherence is lost. And the coherence length is just found, is given by coherence time times 
the velocity of neutrino, and from this formula we find it uh, in this form. <coughs> now, we know that sigma x, the length of the neutrino wave packet, is microscopic. It's typically quite small. However, it is multiplied in this formula by a huge factor. Neutrino energy squared divided by delta m squared. And therefore, the coherence length in all situations uh, for ex terrestrial neutrino oscillations, at least, is a huge well, well, actually, it's always huge value, and the coherence condition is satisfied for all terrestrial experiments, which we know, and can only be violated for neutrinos of astrophysical origin, such as solar neutrinos or supernova neutrinos. Otherwise, the propagation coherence is very well satisfied. Okay, one little aside. Yes, yes please. No, we don't see oscillations. We see flavor conversion, but we don't see oscillations. So that's one mistake which was made even in the statement of the Nobel Pro uh, Committee of Physics that uh, neutrino oscillations were discovered uh, by snow experiment, uh, uh, and that was wrong actually. The snow experiment, the solar neutrino experiment, uh, the, the reactor, sorry, the accelerator experiment, they do observe neutrino oscillations. But the solar neutrino experiment doesn't observe oscillation. Flavor transition, but not oscillation. That flavor conversion of non-oscillatory form. Sorry, what, what means to detect the oscillations? To see the oscillations? Sorry, once again. What means to see the oscillations? So for, for solar neutrinos? When you say we cannot detect, what means detect the... Ah, okay, so, the good question. Assume coherence is lost, which means that we do not detect neutrino oscillation. What do we detect at all, okay? We detect the conversion. No, we... No, it, it's not correct to say that we see nothing. What we don't see is the oscillatory nature of flavor transition. But flavor transition themselves we do see. So what happens if... Uh, if coherence is lost either at neutrino production and detection or on the way between the source and the detector, we would observe the flavor conversion of non-oscillatory nature and the probability of such conversion would be obtained by simply averaging the standard oscillation formula over all the oscillations. It will be a constant suppression for the initial neutrino signal, not oscillating but constant suppression, or constant appearance probability for a neutrino of a different flavor, but oscillations will not be there. Still, there will be some transitions. So it's not true to say that we don't observe anything at all. And how do people detect oscillations? They just... Okay, so let me just give you... So, assume we have a reactor experiment. Okay. Okay. Assume coherence is lost. Then, what we would see that the flux of electron neutrinos, uh, antineutrinos from reactor is lower than expected one, but, uh, and also it's energy independent. It's energy independent and coordinate independent. However, it's very difficult to, to see this effect because we never know very precisely the, the initial flux. Not only for reactors, it's true for any experiment. We know the initial flux with some uncertainty, which sometimes may be quite big. And that's the problem, because we could say we can see, don't see oscillations, but we can see the result of neutrino mixing. That's also important. We don't know the, the oscillation frequency, but we at least know something about the mixing parameters of neutrinos. But that's not true, because the main signatures of neutrino oscillations is a distortion of the spectrum of the emitted neutrino flux and uh, the coordinate dependence of this. And if coherence is lost, both these signatures are lost. We don't see them. And this makes discovering effect of flavor transition extremely difficult uh, for normal experiment. The solar neutrino problem is a different story. I will discuss it uh, probably in my next lecture. Okay. Now, just coming back to this example of the reactor oscillations. 
let us consider for simplicity the two flavor situation. Assume there are only two neutrino flavors. And we consider electron neutrino or electron antineutrino in the case of reactor, uh, and which is emitted by the source, like neutrino reactor, and detected by the detector. Again, electron flavor. So we are looking for the survival probability. I want to demonstrate that even the fact that for a long, long time, reactor experiments didn't show any result of neutrino oscillations is related to the coherence. The, we know now that old reactor experiment didn't see any oscillations because the detector was too close to the source, to the reactor. We need some distance for the oscillations to develop. If we put the detector very close to the source, we don't see any oscillations because the oscillation phase is essentially zero, okay, or very, very small. We need some oscillation phase of order one at least. Okay? Now, the fact that we didn't see any suppression of the signal, assuming that we know the initial flux, is by itself an evidence, a direct consequence and a firm evidence of coherence of neutrinos produced in the reactors. Let me explain this. Okay? Assume we produce electron neutrino, or electron antineutrino, doesn't matter, which is a superposition of new one and new two, and the amplitude of production of new one and detection of new one in the detection process where also electron flavor neutrino is detected is uh, proportional to cosine of mixing angle and the amplitude of production and detection of new two is proportional to sine of the mixing angle. Therefore, if the coherence is maintained, then we have the survival amplitude for neutrinos emitted from the source and detector, uh, detected at some distance from the source equal to the sum of the production amplitude times detection amplitude and the sum is taken over all mass eigenstates. Here, just two. Okay? And this is what is called coherence. We sum the amplitudes. We assume that coherent con conditions are satisfied, then we have to sum the amplitude. If coherence is violated, we have to sum the probabilities instead. Okay? Now, here the production amplitude for new one in detection is cos theta, so we have cosine square theta, and for detection is sine square theta, but there is a phase difference between them, between these two amplitudes, because uh, the phase of acquired by new one and phase acquired by new two upon propagating from the source to the detector are different. And the difference of these phases enters into this expression. This is the phase difference. So we just can take out the common phase from here when we take, because we will take the square modulus in the end, okay? And what matters only the phase difference here, okay? Now, if the source is and the detector are very close to each other, the phase difference is zero, and then we have cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, everything square, and it's one. So the survival probability is one. If we put the detector very close to the source, we don't see any oscillation because the oscillation phase vanishes and we just get one. Now what happens if coherence is destroyed, is violated, either at production or at detection or on the way? Okay. Then instead of adding the amplitude of propagation of different mass against it, we have to add the, pr the probabilities. And if we add the probabilities, we get cosine to the four to of theta plus sine to the four of theta, which is less than one. So instead of taking this sum and taking the, the square modulus of, of, of this sum, uh, we consider the situation, we take the sum of the square modulus of each of this term, not of the sum, in the incoherent situation. We add the probability, so it's cosine to the fourth power of theta plus sine to the fourth power of theta, which is always less than one. So if coherence was lost, we would have seen the deficiency of reactor neutrinos even in very old experiments where detectors were very close to the, to the reactor. And we haven't seen them. So this is the experimental confirmation that the reactor antineutrinos are produced coherently and detected coherently. So that's kind of obvious statement, but it's not widely appreciated, actually. Okay, so maybe a couple more minutes. Uh, 
the coherence conditions for neutrino production and detection are conditioned that the energy difference of different mass against state is smaller than the energy uncertainty. And the condition that there is no wave packet separation on the way be between the source and the detector can be written as this distance is separation distance by the wave packets over the propagation uh, um, of the distance L is smaller than the length of the wave packet. So both these conditions put upper limit on the mass squared difference of neutrinos. So if neutrino mass squared differences are very small, we expect that these conditions are likely to be satisfied. We can, of course, check it explicitly for each particular case. But just on general grounds, we expect it to be satisfied. And this also immediately tells us when, in principle, this could be violated. If we have serial neutrinos with large enough mass, one electron volt is actually, for example, is a large mass for neutrinos. <coughs> It's small mass in general, but it's for neutrinos it's a large mass. So in principle, we can have situations when the coherence conditions are violated. And then we have to be very careful. When we deal with relatively heavy neutrinos, we have to check this again and again. Now, if we write this down uh, as conditions on delta m squared, they, they are always upper bounds. However, here it is a lower bound on sigma e. And if we take into account that the length of the neutrino wave packet is inversely proportional to the energy uncertainty, this is the upper bound on sigma e. So we have some bound which in bounds which in principle can be conflicting. Sigma e should be much bigger than this quantity, but should be much smaller than this quantity from this equation. Okay. And these conditions can only be consistent if this, this expression is much smaller than this one. And if we rewrite it in a convenient form, we can write it as the condition that the oscillation phase is much smaller than the neutrino average velocity divided by the velocity difference. So this is actually a huge number for relativistic neutrinos. And therefore, we have a condition that the oscillation length is limited by some very big number, but cannot be even bigger than this number. Because if it is, then the coherence conditions are not satisfied. In all situations of practical interest, these conditions are satisfied be because of the very small mass square difference of neutrinos. OK, so probably just last slide. As I mentioned, uh, the coherence conditions are very well satisfied in all situations we know for terrestrial neutrino experiments, but they may be, or they may be, they must be violated for neutrinos coming from the sun and from the supernovae. And this has some observable consequences. So at this point, I will stop probably.